Well, thank you very much, and thank you to all of the panelists who have joined me up here to talk about our number one internal corporate priority, as you heard Ian talk about last night. Certainly polio, our number one corporate, corporate priority, but membership being incredibly important. We all know that. We all know that our numbers, as we've heard, have gone down a little bit. It's been a, a cycle over the past several decades, particularly in areas like ours in North America and other parts of the world, Indian and Juliet's part of the world, uh, some parts of Europe. Uh, we, we've seen some of that decline. We've also been talking about incredible flexibility for the better part of a decade right now, doing things just that little bit different to make an attractive and vibrant club experience that people want to be part of. Now I will say, I firmly believe that we do not have an attraction problem in our organization. We have a problem keeping people. And so today, we're gonna to talk with this esteemed panel about what they're doing that's a little bit different in the hopes that it'll inspire some ideas that you may take back to your own clubs and understand that you have permission to do Rotary in the way that works best for you and for your club. And sometimes, you know, we bring someone in and maybe it's not the right fit, and we need to be generous in understanding that if they're not the right fit for our club, maybe they're the right fit for another club. So let's go down and talk a little bit, I want to talk a little bit about the formats of each of your clubs. And Chris, you belong to the Passport Club. And I want you to explain, because some of these are terms that you know are, are somewhat new to many people in the room. What is the Passport Club? What does it mean? How do you meet? And how are you being innovative? Thanks, Jen. Um, yeah, we not only get the question from non-Rotarians about what is Rotary, we also get within Rotary, what is the Passport Club? Um, so our, our, the Passport Club, is a course flexible club. It's a different way, of adaptable club. But the, the main focus of the Passport Club is service, right? So attendance is not the most important thing. Uh, the, the club meetings are not necessarily the most important thing, the uh, services. So our club chooses to meet twice a month. We have a meeting, we have, you know, we have uh, vibrant speakers. Our, our choice is to meet online. We uh, meet virtually through Zoom. That was very popular during COVID and it's uh, still, still popular. It's a great format that works, it's flexible. We have members from different parts of the United States. We've had, we have people in our club that are from Canada and from the United States. And we used to have a member from Georgia and we've had them all over. So we have that flexibility because we meet virtually. Um, attendance is not a big deal. And really the goal of the password club is, and listen here, District 6400, is use the members in the password club to use in the communities within, right? Clubs within the community can use password members for projects, for fundraising, those types of things. We want to be involved in your projects. Um, so that's a little bit about what password is. And, you know, it is a dynamic club. We, we currently have quite a dynamic club. Um, so, a lot of flexibility, a lot of adaptability. And pretty Love it. Who's in the Passport Club here? Show of hands. All right, so you can look around the room and you can see it's a diverse group of people who belong to this. Now, Kim, you are the president of the Trenton Rotary Club right now. Trenton folks in the house. All right, you all are. Way more rowdy than that. I don't know. Maybe, maybe, maybe we should have had cocktail hour at lunch. I don't know what's happening here. Uh, I know, but you are a fun, fun club. So, but you're also more of a traditional club. But you've gotten a little bit more flexible and added some creative, um, some creative ideas to the club in in recent times. Tell us a little bit about what's going on at Trenton right now and what's working. Yeah, I think most of our creative ideas came from. Tending pets, attending those assemblies, you know, putting little things into motion, right? 
So luckily we really do have a traditional club, so when we come in, you know, we have a committee that's going to get everything set up for us that morning. And so we're going to have Zoom all hooked up because we still have members that maybe because of age or illness or somebody that just can't leave their, their job prefers to watch that on Zoom. So we definitely have it all set up, so it's, it's pretty easy for them to do that. We do that traditional, going to ring that bell. And um, what we do is we always start our meeting with, which I always loved, um, with greeting each other. And when we do that, we make sure we greet everybody on that Zoom first, and then we meet each other in the room. But what I think is a little bit more fun for us is that we usually have like a song that we play that might be spitting for whatever's happening in that meeting. So we have a, a, a professional baseball, retired baseball player. So, you know, we played center field that day, a song, and we blasted it, and then so he loved it, the, the speaker loved it, you know, we met everybody on Zoom, it was just a really happy greeting one to another, you know, before we started that meeting, then we do the prayer, we do the pledge, um, we definitely do a moment of silence so that we make sure that we're all inclusive and have a healthy moment of reflection. And we go right into your happy dollars. I know a lot of you do happy dollars, but uh, we do have a really happy group. They do spend a lot. And old Jackson is the happiest guy in the world, right? He's always, I mean, he'll apologize if he doesn't have a dollar, but I'm like, oh, please, you feel a lot. But he's really great. And then we do this whole thing, and I always see if I can do this for you real quick. Because I didn't bring it. So we do this thing. I Try to, you know, like it's called be the one, and Ross right there to be the one. We usually try to recognize somebody in the room. And what I do is I got them from pets honk their horn, right? So we honk a horn, and I do this every week. And I tell you, it gets a little taxing sometimes. I'm like, do they really want to hear me honk this horn? <laughs> yeah. But I pull out a real bike horn, they get really, you know, big. And then we just recognize either as an individual that's in our, in, in our club, it could be uh, an individual that's in our community. We actually did that for Die Pack because they just put on this great family opera show. And so you just try to recognize people and just make them feel a little bit better about themselves. So yeah. I love that. And tell me when you're recognizing someone, what do you see when you look out and that person's being recognized? There, there's a couple things, right? Like as far as the individual themselves, you know, but I, I do, let me just clarify, we, we do have um, a family that donates a lot of money. So sometimes I'm careful to make sure I get permission to announce what they maybe donated to, to recognize that sometimes those people don't have that big high five in front of the group, right? But, um, you know, uh, but for the most part, when you do that, they don't, mostly, they don't know what's coming, you know? And it could be somebody that was running our tree project, or, you know, somebody that just did something nice for somebody in the club, and they're thrilled, they look, they, it, they're they're like, yeah. yeah. Now, I, before we move on to the other two remaining club types, you also have a fun professional evening that you have in your club. And so this is, I think, kind of a, uh, one of the more innovative ways that your club is sort of reaching out to younger professionals. Explain a little bit about that. Yeah, Mark and Jalali actually started that a few years ago, and they're a great group. They're young professionals. And uh, they meet twice a month. They meet on Monday night, 6 o'clock. And they really stick to an hour-long meeting, and they might eat dinner together afterwards. But they pretty much will send, you know, what our agenda is that we, we discussed and they can kind of take from that. But they really... They really run that meeting the way they want to, and, and they, they even have some of their own projects they like to do. We definitely try to pull them into ours, but um, they, I, always, I always call them the young fun ones because I love seeing them, I love seeing them involved. And, you know, but I, I do think it's, when you said losing people, I could go down that path for a minute because I'm concerned about them making sure that they're finding the value they need when they're in those meetings. And talking to Drew last night, I know Paula, we, we pulled, like we have to drive through it because we've got to find out what's going on. And he suggested, just so you guys know, for the young fun ones, he suggested jello shots. So I just want to say that. And I agree with him. And I told him, no, I would make sure to produce them. But, but they do meetings a little differently. In the summertime, they'll, they'll have different settings at each other's houses, which are really nice. But I am concerned they, they're, they're growing families. And I think that if they find the value that they thought they found, that's brilliant. And how many of you uh, would consider yourself to be a young professional? <laughs> so, now you just now you just took my you just took where I was going with this because I was going to ask how many of you consider yourself to be a young thinker? Yeah, that should be the majority of the people that's in here. 
And I say that because you know we do need to make sure that we reflect on our mental age, not always our physical age, and what it is that we do. Because those young people um, bring so much energy and vibrancy. Um, but I know that some of the most amazing Rotarians, the most vibrant Rotarians I've met, have been at the other end of the spectrum. And it's nice that we have this opportunity to, to mesh all of it together. Suzanne, you are the president of Windsor Wide right now, and I want you to explain exactly what that is because it's an acronym, and it's not just you know a wide swath of people. It is very, very meaningful in the intent of that name. I'm actually the immediate past president. I was the charter. That's okay. So I was the charter president uh, last year. Uh, wide stands for we're inclusive, diverse, and equitable, and. In Windsor, we have an incredibly diverse community. Um, it's one of the most diverse communities in Canada. And we want to make sure that Rotary is reflecting our community. And so we've been very, very active in recruiting people uh, who, are, who represent that diverse community. And what we found also in talking to people as they're coming to the, the uh, club is they don't want to just sit through a speaker. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but they want to get out and do something. And so we try to do, and I know a lot of clubs are doing this now, but we try to do a service project each month to make sure that people are active, people are out there and feel like they're making a difference in the community. I love what you just said about wanting to get out there um, to do something. One of the things that it We'll come back to this as an entire discussion in a second, but I want you to answer it right now. How do you figure out what you're going to do? And let me leave it that. Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, one is we've got people who are um, active in other uh, organizations that are, uh, you know, the, the food banks or, or, or things like that, so we can get involved in that. Um, some people have uh, a passion. Um, making uh, blankets for infants in uh, in the hospital, you know that kind of thing. Um, and then we also have people who are uh, have ties to their ethnic community, and there are things that they want to do to bring their ethnic community more into what Rotary is and Rotary into uh, what's going on in their community. And so we actually have a committee uh, that talk about okay, what are we going to do? next month, uh, three months from now, so that we have something lined up for the next three or four months. Excellent, excellent. Our last panelist is Deborah Harshaw, and she is a member of the Rotary Club of St. Clair. And Deb is an environmentalist, and many of you know of her work with Operation Pollination as a member of SRAG, you're going to tell us what that is, um, and also is interested in starting an environmental club. So first question to you, Deb, is, Cause-based clubs, and this is what an environmental club would be, what are they and why is it significant move forward for us as an organization? Okay, um, so cause-based club is basically a club with a particular theme, um, much like environmental justice and inclusion. And so um, we've just taken on as, a, as an organization uh, environmental projects and uh, in, the environment feeds into absolutely all our other uh, areas of focus, so it's really important. And um, that's right, and so that's the second question is uh, the environmental sustainability or in uh, action. And um, so it is a wealth of information of what's going on around the world uh, in terms of environmental projects. <laughs> One of the things, and the reason why I wanted you to explain SRAE, the, the Rotary Action Group, is today we've heard a few times now about Rotary Action Groups and about Rotary Fellowships. How many of you have never heard of those before? Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm heard that there's hands that have gone up, but many that, that didn't. But as a way for our members to engage past the club experience on a broader level, it is a way to engage with people outside of your own club, outside of your own district, and perhaps with people across the globe who have a similar interest. Now, Deb, we were talking earlier on, and you said one of the things that you thought is a major benefit of a cause-based club is that it expands our opportunity for partnerships. Tell me what you think about that. Yeah, 
So a couple of times in the past year that I've been working on uh, environmental projects, uh, people have said to me, I didn't realize that uh, we're going to be some fault in the environment. And so that kind of clued me as to there might be some untapped people out in our community that would love to come on board. You know, initially through an environmental kind of uh, focus, but then you kind of get the right in, and then all of a sudden you're Rotarian, and it's just kind of funny today. Some of you might have met my younger daughter was with me, um, and I brought her here because of the environment. Uh, she's very much uh, involved in the environment and uh, what she does with her, uh, uh, her uh, career. And uh, so somebody suggested to me, well, why don't you look at getting her into your charter, like the charter club? environment and I thought, why did I not think of that? So one of the things that uh, on our club uh, to take care decided to do in our visioning was to reach out to other uh, community uh, organizations. So I've done that. I, I'm going out to field nationals uh, and uh, native things and really connecting into that community because there may be people that are Rotarians at heart and they just don't know about it. And so that's what I'm looking at doing is bringing those people Board. And um, many people that are in their own clubs right now are going to be often having to stay with their club, but they might have a some environmental projects with us. Um, and the other thing is, people that are in or we might know friends or neighbors or family members that are also environmentally oriented and maybe want to also tap into that. So that's kind of a, the two methods that I'm hoping to use to really get this to come on board. That's excellent. Kim, I heard you respond as she was, I heard it, oh yeah. As she was talking about that, what resonated with you? Alright, that's for her. That's okay. No, so let's go through talking about engaging our members. That's something that I think, regardless of our club type, we need to make sure that we're providing for meaningful responsibilities. I honestly believe that we need to ask people what they want out of their experience and then deliver on that. So how is that working in any of your clubs? Any of you who want to answer that, you can jump in first and then we can sort of um, can go back and forth on, on thoughts. I, I would say, you know, one of the, we use one of the tools, a typical tool, we did a survey in our club. And out of that survey, a lot of things like, we are tied, uh, Tarif is an investor club, so she has brought forth to us a, a lot of the information around human trafficking. So we have found that to be sort of of our club is to sort of work on some of those projects. So that those types of things and the survey really talk about how we want to engage more membership and how we're going to do things like that. So a, a survey was helpful. Um, we had data, we had now the, the information, and so it's a good tool. Uh, Sue provided the tool, we got the, the international tool, and we used it, and it, I thought it was really helpful. And if you go on to and you don't even have to log in. If you just did Google put Rotary uh, International uh, Club Survey, it'll take you right to a page that has a wealth of different resources, including that club survey that Chris just spoke about. It's as easy as that to find it and then use it. Um, can you were going to say something? Yeah. Um, when we spoke to Drew last night, he said they were just, you know, just giving them a phone call. Yeah, call some of these numbers and you know, what we're like about the robots. Like, you know, what, what should we do? He's like, you know, maybe don't survey them, maybe just call them and say, hey, what was it that made you so interested? What made you so engaged with us? And what is it that we can actually bring back that you think that we're not doing? And just having that conversation with them, you know, and, you know, just inviting people. What was the thing about the cake last night? Remember we said that, that about baking the cake, we decided that, and also we're going to start baking people cakes. Because it was like, he's going to get the biggest candle ever. That's what he said. So, you know, but I just think, you know, they're going to feel special that way, but I think having that conversation Especially with the ones that we're the most concerned about, which is that six of one. You know, how to just call up and say, what is it? What was it? You know. Do you, how do you deal with that, Susan, in your club? Well, I, I don't know that we deal with it any better than any other club. That's one of the big challenges, I think, for Rotary. But one of the things that just resonated with me is find out what they're interested in before they leave. Don't make, I mean, don't wait till, until they're ready to leave, but make sure that while they're, they're especially at the, the new stage, you know, they're new, they're active, they don't know exactly what they want to do yet, but, but uh, have a mentor for them so that they can then understand what else is going on in Rotary, 
what can I do? Because I know I got things that I want to do, but I don't know what, and I don't know how Rotary can help. So having a, a more senior um, or more experienced Unitarian to mentor them, uh, I think is really helpful to, to get them to know what it is they really want to do. So you just brought up a great concept, the notion of doing an entrance interview. We do exit interviews so often, that's what we do. And it's too late. It's too, they've already left. We're finding out why they left. So asking them on the way in what they want, really well, really well done. One point, though, to take out of that is, do you do that, any of you, with your existing members? Because we have our existing members that, you know, we, we know that we lose people, the highest uh, percentage lead in the second and third year. So, do we do a pulse check? Any of you are a little bit later on with existing members? Somebody who's been in the club for five, 10, 15 years to make sure that it's still a relevant experience for them? Is that something? No? Yeah. So, we're getting a little bit of no here, but I think it's something worth us all contemplating and thinking about because it's not just making the new people who are happy, it's making sure that everyone has that experience. The other thing, you just brought up a really important point about having a mentor. And one thing, interesting comments from the panel, sometimes the person who invites in or is the recruiter is not the right person to be the mentor. And to think about who is the right connection point in the club that can be that person. Because sometimes, you know, somebody's the fundraiser, they can close the deal, but then they move on to the next, the next business. Yeah, I see a lot of, a lot of uh, resonating here. Deb, tell us a little bit more about the kind of projects that uh, you're looking to do, specifically bringing in people who are non-Rotary members. Um, I mean, there's lots of small projects that you can do. Uh, you know, bring in, today was mentioned a couple, actually. Um, the rain gardens, uh, and the information about the medication going into the streets, I mean, that's an environmental issue as well. Um, pollinator gardens, we've got a couple of nice little projects that are going on right now uh, that would be perfect. Examples, um, we're doing a planting of the native, uh, Kingsville Native uh, Planet Society at a local cemetery, planting pollinators around the cemetery area, which often are just, they're not as pollinator friendly as they could be. Um, but one of the things about mentorship, too, is that, uh, you know, my role, uh, I can visualize this as my role in, in getting a close start, is that we one of the mentors, and then there's a few other people in our district that have indicated to me they want to be mentors. So the club's going to take that. I don't know what kind of form it'll take. Maybe I'm kind of visualizing both sides of the border. Uh, maybe having one, you know, uh, on simultaneous days, you know, doing a rain garden here and a rain garden there, so we can kind of engage everybody and having a hybrid kind of format. Um, but I don't know if you have a original question. <laughs> <laughs> I do have a lot. <laughs> no, you're answering it. It's, it really is about involving, involving people who are non vegetarians We just mentioned Kingsville to make something particular with, um, with, with the environment related to that. And I, I want to just point out, that I want to give a shout out to Kingsville uh, South Shore, uh, Dave's in the back of the room, and they did the environmental cleanup day, I think it was two weeks ago, and um, there's I think 20-ish members, 24 members in the club, but the, the cleanup day was 125 members from the community. And they had sponsors because the sponsors actually said, we believe in the environment, we want good things to happen. And they made a lot of money doing the cleanup and had all of these people who they didn't have to say you would be a member, but come and help us clean up. When we ask people to join with us, it's an easier, it's an easier way than saying, come to a meeting. Because how many of us, let's be really honest here, show of hands, how many of you belong to a club who occasionally does not have an attractive meeting. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know what? Isn't it so much easier to ask someone to come to a service project, project and be engaged in something and become friends with them? Um, I want to hear a little bit thought about that. Chris, maybe you can uh, speak to that point. Yeah, I, I mean, definitely. We know just through the experiences that we've had in uh, our club and the stories that we've heard uh, about things in the past and, and stuff that I've done that there have been, you know, when you're actively hands-on, and a lot of times that's what you hear from a lot of younger people is, I don't want to be part of a club, I just want to do service. 
And, and that's what ends up happening. If you, I think that's brilliant to say, like, get those people out to that service project. And we've had that for ramp buildings and stuff like that, where you, you're you doing a, a project where you might need a skilled, skilled person and building a ramp, and they come out and help them. You, know, you might talk a little bit about roading, but they're like, wow, this is great. I really does something for the community. I want everyone else to reflect on that thought. And as you're thinking about something that your club does in that sort of vein, I'm going to give Kingsville another show because they told me about a really cool way that they are dealing with um, recruiting sponsorships and people to support events. They have two times or one time a month, they go to a different restaurant or bar uh, during the month and they all wear their, uh, their club shirts and they just sit down and have drinks and they support that business. And so consequently, that business is seeing them, supporting them, and so that, and they rotate, they go to a whole bunch of them. So that the next time that they go in and say, hey, can we have a gift certificate for one of our annual, you know, our golf tournament or something like that, it's not us always asking, it's giving of ourselves to them, helping their businesses, but then making it an easier ask on the other end. I just want to share that with you because it was like a nice little aha moment to me. I, I've been thinking a lot about this giving love back and forth Kind of thinking, even at the highest level within our organization, trying to figure out ways where it's not always about us asking, it's about giving as well. So, different kinds of things like this. Any other comments anybody wants to make? I, I did want to, I wanted to uh, kind of carry on what Chris was saying. Um, in Essex County, all of the clubs get together and, and, and go to leaders where we chop vegetables and they dehydrate. I dehydrate the vegetables and then it becomes soup mix that goes around the world. That one event, uh, and no matter how many times we do it, brings up more people and brings up more friends of Rotary than almost anything we do. People want to feel good about what they're doing, and so they always come to our uh, Rotary Club at the university. They always come out for it. It's just one of those things that people feel really good about. So if you guys have a service or a project that you want to, you know, try to get people, get the community involved in, I highly recommend it because that is something that people, people will leave and have a good feeling of Rotary because they felt good about what they were doing. Good. Any other comments before I ask Deb? I'm going to ask one last question while we wrap up this. How to you after Deb? Uh, just the other thing was uh, a lot of our clubs do uh, fireside shots. And I know sometimes they kind of go a long time between fireside chats. But the other, the other thing we talked about in our membership meeting is um, during that project, we actually put something hands on. Uh, you could have uh, a couple people that are membership oriented, and they could have a sort of a, you know, not an elevator speech, but kind of a fireside chat that they can do while you're doing that project. Because again, I think uh, leaders, um, maybe we don't have a chance to do fireside chats because we're too busy crying for the onions. But, uh, but, but, but other things you can, and I mean, and that's part of how I'm hoping to do uh, get the environmental stuff going, it's just chatting as we work in the Thank you. Chris, you had a comment on that. Yeah, I just wanted to reiterate what you've said a couple times, Jen, about losing Rotarians, and, and, and the word like losing the Rotarian. Um, I think just the examples here, especially in our basketball club, when to buy these types of club, you, there might be members that are thinking about leaving, or, or maybe they're, you know, you have a, you feel like they're not coming to meetings, where I say reach out to those members and let them, you know, offer these types of things. We have lots of opportunities within the district. Let's not lose the Rotarian. You know, I think we get focused on the club and that whole that member. Um, so I, it, it really hits home with when Jen says that, like, let's, let's find it. Maybe there's a better fit, maybe a different night, maybe a different format. We have that, and I think we're already in the national has realized that. I think sure. things have changed a lot in like, 10 years. You know, we couldn't have done all these virtual meetings 10 years ago, but now we do. So, and maybe that's a format so we don't lose the world right now. Maybe they just want to be so Those are just my thoughts on that. No, I appreciate that, Chris, and, and many of you have heard me joke and say this, and others as well. The Rotary Police are woefully underfunded, and so, you know, doing these things that are outside of the box, don't just think outside of the box, break the box, put the box back together again, and nobody's going to come around and tell you what you're doing is wrong. Um, 
doing it in the right way for you. So the last thing I want to talk about with uh, this group today is some research hot off the press that just, uh, just came out a couple of weeks ago. We interviewed 100,000 Rotarians across the globe about varying aspects of our organization, that annual sort of pulse check, if you will. And they came back with two very interesting thoughts. First, many people, many clubs, many respondents said they appreciate doing smaller projects. Now, we have a lot of focus on programs of scale, our large, our new, relatively now four-year-old grant program, $2 million grants. Um, we have a lot of global grants. This is a district that's very active in global grants. But smaller projects um, really resonated. At the same time, these respondents said it was very important to them to have a corporate, single corporate initiative. So in a post-polio world, wanted to have something big to galvanize before, to, to go forward with. I want you to share with me now, um, each of you, the composition of your club, how you respond both to your community needs and your international needs, and what do you think your club members are looking for as, it's, as I just shared that information with you? Does it resonate? And is that what you're seeing in the field? Chris, you've got a, a thought. Uh, yeah, I, I think it does resonate with our club. I think we have been uh, presented with lots of smaller projects that we want to support. Maybe sometimes too many. <laughs> We're really anxious to support it all. Um, but we also do want to have a little flavor of international. So I think there is a balance, and I think that that works good in our club, attracting new members to that type of thing. I, I absolutely do think that those small projects are really meaningful to a lot of people. They want to have the hands on right in their community and make a difference. Excellent. So then, yeah, I, I agree with that. And I think also our club has a lot of new members and they get overwhelmed by the big projects. They want to make sure that there's something they can do in their community. And those tend to be smaller projects. We'll build up to the bigger projects because there are also a lot of people who are international. They come from other countries. They want to help out at home, and so we're building up to that kind of thing. But it definitely resonates to have a lot of smaller, like our monthly project, being closer to home. Excellent. Kim? I think belonging to something bigger than yourself, like Rotary itself, international, right, is bigger than just one little club, right? It reaches out. So when we have something that we can do that's bigger than ourselves, when we go together, it's you know, we was involved to have that, right? But the little things, we just did, Paula started this peanut butter drive, we call Spread the Love. Mm -hmm. And it, it, was just a peanut, it was just a peanut butter drive. And, and not only did we have somebody that sponsored us with money, she even got hired to match that money. Plus we had people bringing peanut butter. It was just, what, five weeks, Paula? So it was a very small project. But, but yeah, we, we love the small things that get people engaged really quick and see results really so quick. But to be a part of something so big, is, well, and then you get to tell that story, and you heard the response, and we just said that, and everybody was like, oh, that's really cool, that's neat. When we tell those stories, other people want to engage, they like it. Deb, last word from, from you on this one. I think environmental is very easy to have very small projects that are you know, all the way up, uh, you know, the quality of the marine garden, or uh, easy ones to start with. Uh, that's the last thing. Um, some of the bigger projects that I just getting to learn about the mess I'm looking on to as dragon, sort of the more uh, global meetings that I'm in, is it's sometimes it's relating and um, exciting and it's scary all at the same time with things that are going on around the world with the different projects. And so um, I'm still learning in that regard, but I think small and large will be very the small will be very easy to do, the large will require a lot of uh, collaboration and that stuff. So, so that well, but that also, that also leads right into the what we talked about earlier um, in terms of being part of an action group or a fellowship, having that ability at all levels of whatever method our club meets that we can tap into something. And I love, and I want to end on this spot, something that's bigger than ourselves. And I think for all of us, I hope that that's what you feel or your yeah. experience in Rotary, that you are part of something larger than yourselves. And I believe everyone who was here listening to this 
incredible conversation today. You believe that too because you're here. You wanted to be part of something outside of your club experience, coming to a district conference to learn. And to your point, Deb, continue learning. There is no point in time where we stop. And so thank you to each and every one of you for bringing your, your own personal perspective, showing us something that can be done differently. And I'm going to ask a question of all of you, and then we're going to, uh, then we're going to exit. How many of you learned something that you were going to take back to your club? Excellent. I am thrilled, 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 and I want to thank each and every one of you for your incredible contribution, your leadership, and for being part of our organization. Ladies and gentlemen, please give it up for them.